Well, you can say goodbye to the iPod. Apple officially nixes the iPod after 21 years. I have an article here for you at The Guardian. This is by Dorian Linsky. Last name L-Y-N-S-K-E-Y. Came out May 11th. Title of the article, R.I.P. the iPod. I resisted you at first, but for 20 years, you were my musical life. It held my favorite mainstream tracks and the obscure ones, but it couldn't hold off the march of time and Spotify. And he's got a picture of himself fiddling with the iPod. Goes on to say here, it's the end of the iPod era. The news that Apple is pulling the plug on the iPod Touch and thus the entire 21-year-old line is curiously timed for me because I only recently retired my iPod Classic. Every month for the past 30 years, I've made a compilation of my favorite songs and it's a time capsule of musical memories. For the first decade, I used cassettes to make my compilations. This required a lot of creative editing, tense retakes, and hovering over the pause button like a predator. Oh, I miss those days. Those days were awesome. For those of you who weren't around then, I remember using reel-to-reel tape. And I still maintain that reel-to-reel tape is the best audio format out there, although it was the most expensive. So a shout goes out here to Techmoan and his channel, because he did a video talking about the most expensive audio format ever made, and that was reel-to-reel tape. Because depending on the number of tracks on the tape, and if you go back to the 1950s, a uh, two-track tape gave you better sound quality than four tracks, but you used a lot of tape. So it was very expensive to produce a song or an album using reel-to-reel tape with, let's say, just two tracks. But I loved using reel-to-reel tape. Audio cassettes. A lot of these bands that we know now got their start by selling cassettes out of the trunk of their car. After that, the simple drag-and-drop of an iTunes playlist felt miraculous. Even once Spotify arrived, I kept this up for years as an act of commitment Love a song, buy a song, own a song. But for boring technical reasons, the computer that housed my music could no longer handle the iTunes store. So I had to download songs on one device, transport them to another, and individually add them to the library, a process which was almost as laborious as making a tape, and not as fun. Reprogrammed by touchscreens, my fingers found the iPod's click wheel increasingly alien. Why was I still doing this? I didn't know, so I stopped. I never owned a touch, so its demise doesn't move me any more than that of the Nano and Shuffle five years ago. I did my Sick Transit Gloria routine back in 2014 when my model, the iPod Classic, mine was 160 gigabits, was discontinued. It's a sturdy little brick with just one job music and lots of it. I could listen to it nonstop for more than three months and never repeat a song. Well, you could technically do that with reel-to-reel tape. It would just take a lot of reel-to-reel tape. No, but seriously, depending on the speed with reel-to-reel tape, you could put hours and hours, if you had a four-track machine, you could do hours and hours of music without ever having to repeat a track once. Or twice. How does that really go? Is it once? Is it twice? It knows nothing of the cloud. The touch, by contrast, always struck me as a glittery dilettante, which didn't carry nearly enough music, but it was still popular with people who wanted a specialist device with more memory and battery life than an iPhone at a fraction of the price. Good for kids, too. Once smartphones got better and cheaper and streaming destroyed downloads, the need for a separate music player evaporated, so it goes. Yet the iPod still has advantages over streaming, and not just the fact that it won't pay a podcaster millions of dollars to talk nonsense about vaccines. Amen to that. Everybody has their own Spotify experience, but we're all drawing from the same pool of music, which is vast but limited. The more music, the better. The more choices you have to consume that music, the better. My iPod contains many songs that streaming does not acknowledge, Forgotten B-sides, culled from old CD singles, bootleg remixes plucked from file-sharing platforms, 
Sundry rarities downloaded from now-defunct websites, albums snarled up in copyright issues, the catalogs of Spotify Exiles, Neil Young, and Joni Mitchell. It is a unique collection of music curated over many years in which each song represents an act of choice. It's mine alone, and it always should be. The consumer should be in control of what they want to consume when it comes to music. So I'm well aware that I'm not the typical music consumer, and it would be hard to argue that the world's most valuable company should continue to cater for collectors who simply must own the Chemical Brothers remix of Spiritualized or MIA's debut mixtape. Like the turntable decades earlier, the iPod has gone from being a mass market device for anyone who loves music to a niche product for the hardcore. Apple is not in the niche business. Now, here's my philosophy about this. I know Apple's a big company. A lot of these recording uh, companies are, or probably uh, uh, record labels are. But you should be catering to everybody, bringing in revenue from wherever you can. And now, from my own experience of going on YouTube, looking for music by lesser known composers, discovering, uh, let's say, a piece by a jazz artist I didn't know was out there. It's something that I would like to have in my collection. And that music should have been made available to the public back in the day on the airwaves. And it wasn't. So you have all this great technology that is giving us all these options to download songs now. You had the iPod, which is going away. But the more choices we have, the better. The more competition you have, the better it's going to be. And everybody benefits. So cater to the average music listener. Cater to the niche market. Get all the revenue you can. That's how real creativity explodes in the market. It's what will drive the market. Now that the Agile Upstart has become a knackered war horse laden with nostalgia, it's worth remembering that the iPod was contentious when it was launched back in October 2001, holding a then remarkable 1,000 songs, what the author Stephen Witt calls, quote, the most ubiquitous gadget in the history of stuff, did more for Apple, paving the way for the iPhone and iPad than it did for the music industry. Well, the arrival of the iTunes store 18 months later helped to stem illegal file sharing. The iPod still allowed users to unbundle individual tracks from albums. Download sales never came close to making up for the collapsing CD revenue during the music business's lost decade. Early 2000s, lost decade of the music industry because they didn't want to change their business model. They didn't want to get with the times. Rather than embracing all these people who wanted to go to Napster and download this music or share these files, they shunned it. Should have gotten in on the action, dummy. All that free promotion, exposure. You know, Liberace, and I may have mentioned this before, Liberace learned a very valuable lesson after his palimony case, that all publicity is good publicity. I was initially grumpy about the iPod, complaining that it devalued music and drove a bulldozer through the concept of the album, a shuffle function, question mark, barbarians. Eventually, of course, I bought one and loved it. As we now know, the album survived as an artistic entity. Whenever I read an article declaring the death of something, I'm pretty sure that it's not really dead. Vinyl makes a comeback, and even clunky, fallible cassettes are enjoying a modest revival for some reason that I don't entirely understand. It's probably part nostalgia. Yet the iPod, as opposed to the broader concept of the digital music player, relies on one company. So it has as a as dead as something can be, devoured by the very revolution it launched. My iPod this is funny. My iPod sits on my desk, battery drained, silent as a paperweight, but I know that if I fire it up, 
I will have almost 20 years of my musical life in the palm of my hand. That's me in there. So once again, an article by Dorian Linsky at The Guardian, talking about the death of the iPod. So Apple is officially nixing the iPod. Thought I'd share this with you. But I think one of the big mistakes, and I've also mentioned this before with the recording industry, is their failure to keep these formats on the market as long as possible. So what if the sales of albums were going down and people were going more for CDs or cassettes? If you keep every format out there, people will easily be able to transition from one format to another. It's funny how that works. You know, if you look at the revolution of the, or pardon me, the evolution of the audio cassette, that goes back to the 1950s, 1957 with RCA, who came out with the first shelled real to real, first quote-unquote cassette. But it was actually two reel to reels in a cassette shell, and you had to play it in this big machine, this cabinet, but it didn't take off. But that was the precursor to the audio cassette. And over time, they were able to uh, make the uh, cassette smaller or reel to reel tape smaller, put it in a shell, call it a cassette, reduce the speed to what we had in the 70s and the 80s with audio cassettes, ferric tape. But I really like this article, and I hope you too, if you have a chance to go and read it. Uh, so thank you for being with me. Culture Confederacy saying peace out. Stay safe, everybody. God bless this great country. I'll catch you next time. And y'all have a great week.